reconciled to God. Four, He, God, made Him, Christ, who knew no sin to be sin for us. That's accomplished. That we might become the righteousness of God in union with Him. That's applied. You can see that principle there. Redemption accomplished and redemption applied. God accomplishes salvation in Christ so that He can apply it to believers. Let's look at 1 Peter 3. If you go to 1 Peter 3, verse 18. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that He might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. So you can see there, He suffered once. It's done. Accomplished. That He might bring us sinners to God. Applied. So this morning, when we're talking about regeneration, we're talking about that we might become the righteous, that, that second part, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. We're talking about this part where it says that He might bring us to God. If I broaden that, it would include regeneration. Okay. I think that's important for us to keep in mind, you know, where we are when we're talking about a, a subject. Um, we are looking at salvation this morning as it subjectively applies to a sinner and not salvation as it objectively was accomplished by Christ. Yes, this is the work of the Lord God Almighty, but it's not the meritorious work of the Lord Jesus Christ when He regenerates a sinner. He's already accomplished that. Um, before I've, I've in the class, not this one now, I want to talk to you briefly about why these two are together. Regeneration and conversion. Um, conversion, so regeneration precedes conversion. That's very important. Um, but the, the, the illustration I would have put up here, and I'm not going to draw it, uh, would be like a tree with its roots. The roots being the regeneration and the tree that grows from it is conversion. So what is regeneration? If you got a handout, I had some printed. Um, next to that title, it says, A Work of God Alone. A Work of God Alone. The definition that we have written down there is from Wayne Grudem. Uh, regeneration is a secret act of God in which He imparts new spiritual life to us. And let me just observe that. Regeneration is a secret act. And what does He do? He imparts new, not that there was any there, new life, what kind of life? Spiritual life to us. So, intergeneration is this imparting new spiritual life to us. So, let me ask you this um, before we get now going towards and into regeneration. What are some of the changes that have taken place in the lives of believers here? You can use practical examples or be more broad. Either one. Think about your conversions. Think about what changes have occurred and in your life and the lives of others. Uh, you're more obedient, you're predisposed to good deeds, peaceful, gentle. Yeah. Obedience, there where there was none. Uh, gentleness. We hate our sin. Yeah. Uh, one of the changes that have taken place in the lives of the believers here is they hate sin. 
so even um like loving what we once hated and hating once we will hating once we but um, once loved yeah there's that there's a complete uh it's almost like a magnet always like points north well now all of a sudden it points this way there's this complete switch uh anything else Rally? Thinking you want to tell everybody about Christ and His work yeah. in your life. Yeah, we regard no one according to the flesh, and we used to regard Christ according to the flesh. Uh, now we do that no more. Um, yeah, that's amen. Um, now we we don't see people the same way. Uh, we see foremost, what is their relationship to God? Do they know God through Christ? We didn't consider that a priority when we were unconverted. We might not have even considered it at all. Yeah, and it makes me think of 1 Thessalonians uh, when I think of conversion and how um, we, we turn from idols to serve the living and true God. Amen. And to wait for His Son from heaven. Amen. And uh, so our, our disposition towards God, though, though we may have been religious before or made religious professions or had religious experiences before regeneration, we're dead to God and God dead to us. We had, um, we had gods of our, our own making, gods in our own likeness. And when conversion happens, we, we are brought, as Peter said, we're, we're brought to God. You know, we come to an understanding of the one and true living God. We draw near to God through Christ. God draws near to us through Christ. And um, we, like, we know Him. We commune with Him. Amen. These are glorious uh, truths. So the next question is, what is the specific cause of these changes? What caused it? What caused the change? Did you want to say something, Anya? A new heart, right. Any, anybody want to add anything to that? Sergio? You go ahead and, and speak once you're ready. I would say the Holy Spirit's work is what causes it to, yes. to change. Yep. And Josh. I think of um, 1 Peter chapter 1 and how you're talking about the effectual calling. That's through the Word of God that one is born again. Amen. Uh, all right answers. So the answer to that question, and you already... Uh, have the knowledge on it is regeneration. Um, so I want to uh, go just read. I just want to read some texts that teach regeneration. We'll just read them and then we'll go from there and, and, and go to one in particular and, and explain it. So first of all, if you would turn to... Um, well, let me ask you, what are, what are some key texts? You have the handout, and it has Titus, John 1, and John 3. So, it, excluding those, what are some other key texts? Uh, 2 Corinthians 5.17 um, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. And brief comment, why is that regeneration? Um, I agree with you, but why? <laughs> Make a comment. If you don't um, well, if you continue reading, it says, old things have passed away. Uh, that would be a reflection of a uh, heart of stone. And behold, all things have become new. So because of regeneration, then uh, the entire 
being is nature and everything yeah. that he is changes. So you have the word creation there, a new creation. Any other texts that come to mind? Brian? In Ephesians 2. Ephesians um, 2. He says, um, But God, being rich in mercy because of His great love with which he, had, he loved us, even made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. Amen. Made what? Made alive. New creation. Made alive. Any other text? Josh Dodge. And am I missing? I'm sorry. I, I kind of... Ben's next. Hopefully I don't take Ben's. Um, uh, Hebrews chapter 8, verses uh, 7 through 13 where it talks about the new covenant, quoting from uh, Jeremiah. Amen. Amen. Where he says, I will write that my laws on their hearts. And then Ben. I was going to say, uh, Ezekiel 36, 20, verse 26 and 27. Amen. I'll give you a new heart of new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of, that's heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. Amen. That one's very clear. Let, let's, let's stop there and just now let's read some of these texts. Uh, some of them have already been read. So we'll start with the ones on the handout, Titus 3. And what we're trying to just get familiar with is does the Bible teach that regeneration is a secret act of God in which He imparts new spiritual life to us? And can we add more to that definition? Um, what does the Bible teach is regeneration? And let's read some texts and just get familiar with the Scriptures. Titus 3. I'm going to read 1-7. to seven. Remind them to be subject to to rulers and authorities to obey, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility to all men. For we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But when the kindness of God, the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us, through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that having been justified by His grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So you can just see by comment there that here we are in this state of hatred and deception, and God not by our own works, but according to His mercy and through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. Isn't that interesting? Washing of regeneration and renewing. That goes back to John 3 where Jesus says, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, you'll by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. And we're going to look at John 3 this morning. But it, it lines up well with this, the washing of regeneration. But the, the key there is you can see the Bible's really clear. Salvation came by regeneration. Let's read John 1, 9 and 14. So we have regeneration. It's, a, it's something that where God acts in His mercy. It's not related to our works. Uh, there's a washing sense in it and there's a renewal sense in it. Now let's go to John 1. And I'm going to read uh, verses on your handout, 9 to 14. That was the true light which, got, which gives light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through Him. And we know this is the Word, which is Jesus. And the world did not know Him. 
he came to his own, that's the Jews, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. To those who believe in his name. Well, why do they believe? Verse 13, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So here you can see, it doesn't say the word regeneration, but you can see uh, what is it that causes men to believe? It's their birth. It's not talking about their physical birth. It's talking about being born of God. Not of blood. It doesn't matter your descendancy, your heritage in this earth. It doesn't matter about the will of man. So it's of God. So you can see here, regeneration is of God. And the Bible uses the word God wants us to fix in our mind regeneration is like birth. It really is birth. Um, you know, we think backwards sometimes. It's like uh, we think that the physical often is the greater truth. And I don't want to make a, a terrible distinction between physical and spiritual. But, you know, like uh, Adam and Christ. Well, Adam got his existence in history because God wanted to use him to teach us about his son. Not uh, Adam is preeminent and then um, his son informs us about Adam. Yeah, that's true, but the, the Adam's purpose in life, it's not like Adam failed and then God thought ahead of, afterwards, well, let me how, how can I save these people? I'll, bring, I'll send Christ into the world. No, Christ was ordained before the foundation of the world. And Adam just got his existence and his place in history so that he could teach us about Christ to come. Well, similarly, you know, like we have physical birth, but a greater birth than that, I believe, is our new life in Christ. I don't want to go, I don't want to carry that too far. But there was a relationship there and. Uh, were it not for physical birth, we wouldn't really understand regeneration as well as we do. Okay, let's read John chapter 3. Verses 1 to 8. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are our teacher come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, or born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from or where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. So in John 1, we saw of God. Here we see of the Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. We see that this new birth, which we're calling regeneration, is a necessity for one to enter the kingdom of God. Okay. And Genesis 3.15, God has promised this from the beginning. Um, I'm just going to read that. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. When Adam and Eve sinned, they were guilty. They now had um, become alien to the Lord. When He came walking in the cool of the garden, their, their guilt, their shame, and the, the, the already existent separation between them and the Lord was manifest and they're hiding from Him and their fear of the condemnation due them for their sin. Their hearts were changed. 
immediately when God is uh, accusing them or uh, bringing them to judgment, they, what do they do? They, they, they deflect in self-righteousness. It's the serpent, the woman. That sin. The sin principle now exists in them. They are totally depraved. And God says, I'm going to put... So what had happened is an amity between man and Satan occurred. A peace, a fellowship, a unity, a relationship. And God comes in there where they're there and He says, I'm going to change that. I'm going to put enmity between you. Where there's peace, there's not going to be peace anymore. And God must change their nature for that enmity to exist. So right here, in the midst of this promise in its seed form, is regeneration. Because there must be a change of the heart for one to be an enmity with the serpent. If you go to Deuteronomy 30, And I'm going to look at 4 to 6. The verse I'm focusing on is 6. If any of you are driven out to the farthest parts under heaven, from there the Lord your God will gather you, and from there He will bring you. Then the Lord your God will bring you to the land which your fathers possessed, and you shall possess it. He will prosper you and multiply you more than your fathers. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to this end, to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul that you may live. So here you can see it's not given in terms of born again, it's given in terms of circumcision, a cutting off of that which offends in the heart. And it's, we can also see what is the purpose of regeneration. To love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul. For your good. For God's glory and for your good. That you may live. That you may have peace, joy, patience. That you may have communion with God Almighty and know Him. Um, that you might know something of the love of God in communion with Him. That He might do good to you. And that you might have uh, eternal life in His Son glorified one day. So you can see regeneration isn't just a standalone thing that doesn't have a purpose either. Okay. So those are some texts. Let's look one more. Psalm 110. Verse 3, and I'm going to start at verse 1 to get there. A Psalm of David, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. And we know this is, has a reference to Jesus' ascension in session. The Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people shall be volunteers in the day of your power. In the beauty of holiness from the womb of the morning, you have the dew of your youth. You can see here that when God saves, you see regeneration is in the day of God's power. So when God is making someone born again, He's circumcising for the purpose to love Him, and all those things, the, re the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit, we also can see here that it's of God's power and that the will of the people is changed into a volunteer. 
there's some errors associated with regeneration that people like to fight it with. And they say that um, God forces men against their will and they're robots. And that they um, are obedient, um, but not willingly. Uh, Six still has a question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so he mentioned uh, he was reading Wayne Grudem and he made some comments or had a section on the relationship of regeneration and faith, which right here in conversion, when I use that word, it includes faith. This is a repentance and faith. Um, it's it's a, the turning which requires faith. It's the repentance or the, the faith that requires turning. Um, and I mentioned that early on that this is kind of like the tree and that's the roots. So the, the conversion is a fruit of the regeneration to make comment. But, but you can see here that when someone is regenerate, they become a volunteer. All right, so those are some texts to get you familiar. I didn't write them up there because we went through them uh, at such a pace, I think, that you could have wrote them down. Um, but now let's look at the definition. We already read Wayne Grudem's. Let me read a couple more and then we'll get into more of the it itself. God effects a change, this is John Murray, which is radical and all per pervasive, a change which is, cannot be explained in terms of any combination or permutation or accumulation of human resources. So it doesn't matter however you think. Human resources have nothing to do with the change of regeneration. It is a change which is nothing less than a new creation by God who calls the things that be not as though they were, who spake and it was done, who commanded and it stood fast. Burkhoff, regeneration is that act of God by which the principle of new life is implanted in man and the governing, the governing disposition of the soul is made holy. The disposition. So when you think about what are we predisposed to believe? What are we predisposed to love? What are we predisposed to do? What is our bent? Our orientation? Our direction? It used to be to hate God and to be unholy. And when, you get re when God regenerates you, He changes your disposition to, toward Him to love God, and to be holy. Uh, I mentioned earlier its relation to the effectual call. Like if you had your system at, or uh, your confession and you went there, where's regeneration here? It doesn't have a chapter on regeneration, but it's still in here. Uh, it's actually in the section on the effectual calling. And you can see it here. Let me, let me just read this. I'm, I'm trying to bring to your awareness and teaching you uh, not only if biblical familiarity, not only a thorough definitions, but also give you uh, some historical teaching. So, paragraph one, those whom God hath predestined unto life, He is pleased in His appointed and accepted time effectually to call, there's the call, by His Word, the Word of God, and His Spirit. When we talk about God calling effectually by His Spirit, that by His Spirit is regeneration. And what is it that God does when He calls us by the Spirit and that part of the Spirit being regeneration? What is it? It's 
it's out of the state of sin and death in which they were by nature to a state of grace and salvation by Jesus Christ. What specifically does that look like? What does that involve when you say that it's out of this state of sin and death by nature and to a state of grace and salvation by Jesus Christ? What does that involve? It gets even more specific. Here's what He does when He regenerates you. He enlightens your mind spiritually and savingly for what end? To understand the things of God. When you're unregenerate, you don't understand the things of God. There's none who seeks after God. There's none who understands. You don't know the Lord. You don't have any idea. The, your guilty conscience according to the works of the law in your heart is still perverted. Though you have a right to be guilty and should be ashamed of your sin, you don't know Him. It requires a supernatural act of God by the Spirit alone to change your heart and to turn you towards Him that you might understand Him. We have to have our, our, eye, our minds enlightened. You know, like when you walk into a room and it's pitch black and there's no windows or nothing, you can't see anything. There's no, let's say there's no light whatsoever. Even the crack in the door is sealed. It's pitch black. I mean, you put your hand right here, I can't see a thing. But somebody flips the switch, and you're like, man, I can see everything. Look at this room. I never knew this room looked like this. That's regeneration. God enlightens your understanding so that you see Him. You see His Son, Jesus Christ, as glorious, the pearl of great price. It doesn't just stop there either. It's the things of God in general as well. I can't, uh, uh, how many times have we heard people say, I understand things in my Bible I never used to understand. Like I actually am living that and now I understand what it's saying. Um. Next, what else does it involve when we say get God saves us out of state of sin and grace, or sin and death to us out of our nature to a state of grace and salvation by Jesus Christ? What else does that involve? It involves taking away their heart of stone and giving to them a heart of flesh. So that is just don't get wrapped up on that word flesh, because the Bible has a lot of definitions for the word flesh. It's just making a contrast. With, with an illustration or a figure of speech as to something that's hard, like a rock, a stone, and something that's soft, like human flesh. Like that's really malleable and I can move it around. It's soft. Whereas a stone is not. What is a stone unable to do? Well, when I, went, when I put pressure on a stone through touch, it doesn't move. It's... Uh, obstinate to that pressure. But when I put pressure on my flesh, it moves. It's uh, submissive to the pressure. And that's what God does with our heart. Well, and what kind of pressure? Not physical. It's His will. God's will is clear in the law that has writ that is in our understanding and our conscience which informs and judges on the basis the Word of God comes to us in the Word. People admonish us in the world. And everywhere God's goodness is shown in disclosing to you His name and His will is like a pressure on you. Believe this. Trust in Me. Pressure. Do this. Don't do that. Pressure. And when you have a heart of stone... You're obstinate to all that. You won't believe. You won't trust. You won't do. But when you have a heart of flesh, you believe. You do. It pushes there. So that's kind of the illustration of when God regenerates us. He takes that heart of stone and He puts in a heart of flesh. Pastor Mark? I was just going to say, brother, that's one, one of the reasons I love that reference in Deuteronomy 30 that you brought up a few minutes ago, that um, I want to say it's Deuteronomy 5, where the Lord says, like, He gives them the law, 
They can't keep the law. He gives them the covenant curses. They're going to fail to obey the law. And God says, oh, that my people had a heart to love me and obey me and keep my commandments. And then Deuteronomy 12 or so, Moses is bewailing their hard-hearted disobedience and says, uh, the Lord has not yet given them a heart to believe, to perceive, ears to hear, a heart to perceive the things commanded by God. And then later on, I want to say it's Deuteronomy, it's right before Deuteronomy 30, 28, 29, where uh, it says essentially the same thing. They've not yet been given a heart to believe. So then God says in Deuteronomy 30, then I will circumcise the foreskin of your heart. I will give you a heart to believe, right? And God does that work that ends our stubborn rebellion against him. Amen. Yeah, it, it's uh, amazing, too, how much revelation there is back in the Old Testament about these truths. Okay. And the last thing in here, what else does it involve? A renewing of their will. Drawing them to Jesus. The will is self-righteous, self-complacent, and just self-willed. And it won't change. It will not stop seeking to please itself. Um, like sheep, we have all gone astray, each to his own way. We go our own way when we're unregenerate. But when God regenerates and He does all these things that we've been reading, one of the things He does is He renews their will by His power and He draws them to Jesus. And in John 6, Jesus said, what, what, uh, I don't want to misquote it, but He says, unless the Father which who has sent me draws you, Him, I might be misquoting that. Let me read it. 644, I think it is. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. So, regeneration is the inception. Or, I would say the call is, but the regeneration is the application of the call. It's part of the call where God draws you to Christ. So you can also see regeneration is to love, to know the Lord, to be holy, but specifically, it's to direct you to Christ. You know, when somebody says, I have a new heart, and they don't put their trust in Christ, they don't make much of Christ. And I know that regeneration is secret, and it might have different fruits for different people initially. But in time, what you're going to see is a person who... They already have turned. They love the Lord, but they can't explain it and define it. And they can't say exactly what it is that what they're pinpointing their target on. But they know it's Jesus Christ that they must trust. And that might become more and more clear in time and in their saying. Some people it's real clear right off the bat. Um, but it must come to Christ. Okay, so having given you those definitions and letting you know that it's related to the effectual call, I want to look at John 3 with the time that we have. So Nicodemus, who is a Pharisee, the Bible even says a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, came to Jesus by night in chapter 3, verse 1. And he said, Rabbi, teacher, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. So that he, he, he and whoever he's meaning they cannot deny that Jesus is in some way from God because of the works. Um, and obviously Nicodemus is, is making some kind of a risk here because it was not common for a Pharisee in the New Testament through the Gospels to come like this and, and humbly ask questions. Normally, normally when they're coming to Jesus in the middle of the day with their friends and they're testing Him. Here we got one coming at night asking humble questions. But on the other hand, He is coming at night. He's not coming in the day saying, I renounce my self-righteousness. I renounce my Pharisaic self-righteous tradition and I, Lord, I'll follow you wherever you go. But he is in between. He's kind of curious. Something about 
what Jesus is saying and doing by God's grace is convicting him and he wants to find out more. And Jesus answered and said to him, and Jesus just is the prophet. Uh, he exegetes the Father. Um, he's wisdom incarnate. He knows everything, but he acts now as mediator and he speaks to Nicodemus in exactly what Nicodemus needs to hear. You got to keep the context in mind because when you twist text, if you're normally re re disregarding context. He, Jesus is not talking to a crowd, he's not talking to his disciples, he's talking to Nicodemus. And he just says, Truly, truly. I say to you, unless one is born again, Nicodemus, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You can't uh, get it. Unless you're born again. Later on, he's going to say, are you the teacher of the Israel and you don't know these things? This is something that Nicodemus should have known. It's something that the Bible foretold and already revealed. The salvation is of the Lord. It requires a new heart, a circumcised heart to be saved. Nicodemus should know that. In his love of self and sin, he has overlooked and purposely and will rejected all the teachings of the Old Testament and picked up the tradition as a substitute which involves some Scripture or maybe a lot of Scripture. And now in his self-righteous life, he doesn't understand what it means to be born again or that it's even a necessity. And Jesus hits him right square in the forehead. Because it's exactly what he needed to hear. If you're self-righteous and self-complacent, you know what that man needs to hear? You must be born again. Think about how that would humble you. Like, man, I'm working so hard. I've got a whole life of works. And i got to be born again? What does that mean? You mean start over? How, how can I get it? You can't get it uh, on your own. And then Nicodemus said to him, he's confused, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Uh, Nicodemus being a Pharisee and a teacher, um, I don't think that he thought Jesus was being literal. I don't believe that... Um, he believes entirely that Jesus is being literal, but he has no frame of reference um, by which to, to take Jesus' words otherwise. So he just asks what he thinks is an obvious follow-up question to see if he can learn more. How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? I say that because Nicodemus is familiar with Scripture. He's a teacher. He's not like a child. He's a man, a teacher. He's read the Scripture. He knows God's Word is full of figures of speech. Jesus has already preached some. Okay. And Jesus says again, most assuredly, truly, truly, I say to you, Nicodemus, keep saying it that way, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Earlier he said born again. Now he's more specific. Born of water and the Spirit. So this born again has to do with being born of water and the Spirit. He cannot enter the kingdom of God. And Jesus makes it clear to him. Nicodemus, I want to be clear. I'm talking about something categorically different. That which is of the flesh is flesh. That which is of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from or where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. So he's telling Nicodemus, it's like the wind, Nicodemus. The wind is a fact, regardless of you. It's a certainty. Also, the wind is independent of you. And, and the wind is secret. You can't see it but you can see its effects. Those are three major things that that illustration teaches us about regeneration. Is that it is a fact. It's a certainty. 
that it um, uh, can't be perceived. And that it's sovereign. It goes where it wants. So to, to wrap up, what does that mean, water and the Spirit? Um, I don't believe Jesus is referencing water baptism because He's not speaking to after the resurrection. He's not speaking to John the Baptist. He's speaking to Nicodemus who is familiar with his Bible and think about the, the lifestyle and tradition of Nicodemus where in Nicodemus's life is water used in a religious sense for cleansing, for purification? And in Ezekiel, where Ben read earlier, he says, I will cleanse you from all your iniquities. I will sprinkle you with water. Um, and I believe that is Jesus saying, two aspects of the same thing of regeneration. One is you're cleansed when you're regenerated. You're, you're cleansed from the nature that you once had. And you are given a new nature. Um, that's where I'll leave it. Uh, it's important that you know the difference. I was going to read to you Ford Porter. He uh, was, I think, in the 60s, 70s evangelizing, and he was practicing the Romans road, and, and I'm using him as an error. And in his tract, um, he says this, In the Bible, God gives us the plan of how to be born again, which means to be saved. There's already a problem there. Born again, you could say that, but he's getting ready to make it clear that's not what he understands. Regeneration is an aspect of salvation. It's not the totality of salvation. So to equate them is wrong. And he equates them. So he's including everything. And then, so from there, he says, so in the Bible, God gives us the plan of how to be born again, which means to be saved. His plan is simple. You can be saved today. How? First, my friend, you must realize you are a sinner. And I, I know that I don't want to be too hard where it's incorrect, but this tract reveals that this man sees even born again as a plan of man, uh, as God's plan for man that he must follow. That doesn't line up with the wind blows where it wishes. God doesn't say, I've got a plan for you, and now I want you to listen to the, the Gospel, and then I want you to go get yourself regenerated by a decision. So, another point I want to make with that error is that regeneration precedes conversion precedes a response. It is the source and power from which the response can even come. Regeneration is a supernatural work of God. And if you are, unless you're born again, unless you're regenerated, you will not see the kingdom of God. So let's, let's pray and we'll close. Gracious Father in heaven, uh, thank you for the new birth. We praise you, uh, Lord Jesus Christ, for your work on our behalf and accomplishing that which we receive as part of the reward. Please help us to uh, be uh, living vessels of mercy today as we worship, continuing to worship. And to uh, be grateful, Lord, for regeneration. And Lord, all those texts in First John that I know regeneration leads to and ought to lead to, the seed of God in us, I pray, Lord, that you would help us to fulfill that which you have regenerated us to do. In Christ's name, amen.